that idea that we communicate uh, through visual arts is just, it's almost like magic, you know? And I think that one of the reasons I, I, I sort of do paintings that I think of as sort of simple in a way is that I want that, you know, sort of poetic quality to it, that you're drawn into it what's in what seems like a, just a perceptual way, but it's more than that, mm -hmm. you know? Glenn Rennell, I yes. finally snagged you yeah. from your holdout down in the south. What is that, Wilcox? Uh, Pierce. Where is Pierce? I don't Pierce know is there. 25 miles south of Wilcox. Oh, it's a town, huh? Yeah, sort of. How big? Sunsites is sort of the village, uh -huh. and then it goes... What's it called? Sunsites. Oh, it's that's awful. Like, that's unbelievable. I've been living here all my life. I don't yeah. even know about that. So uh, Pierce runs from the Dragoons to the Chiricahuas. Yes. It's about 10 miles north to south, and the rest is all east to west. Yeah, it's gorgeous. About 30 right miles, there, right? yeah. That's all Chiricahua area, yeah. Apache Stronghold and all that. Yeah. Right. You paint that area? Yeah. Some? Yeah. I mean, I should know this I mean, since this, I've represented the, you for how long? That one there is, <laughs> that's the view from the studio. By the way, those who are watching this on YouTube, <laughs> you can actually see a couple of the paintings we hung on the back right. of on my wall of Glenn's work. Yeah. So, Glenn, where did you grow up? I don't know. I, You know, this is uh, the great thing about doing this podcast. Right. I've represented you for... 20 years, almost. 20 years, okay. Yeah. And, um, but I really don't know the backstory, and I, yeah. and I have a funny feeling I would be a little bit surprised. I don't know. I think so. I was born in Maine. Both my parents See? were from Portland, Maine. I'm surprised already. <laughs> and uh, grew up in New England in Boston area, and then Rhode Island, and then moved to New York. And so from... So, Most of the growing up was in New York. I, you know, from fifth grade until I graduated from high school. In New York City? No, in Northport, New York, which is on Long Island, about 30 miles from the city. But you were kind of born, born in Maine, lived in Boston, and then grew up really in Long Island? Mostly, yeah. So when did you first recognize you were interested in art? How old were you? I don't know. I think that that's how my... My mother said, go draw, yeah. you know, uh -huh. so three years old, I think I was drawing, but, you know, I was a terrible student in school, like so many painters, except, right? Except probably in art, right? Yeah, no, I was fine. And, you know, to this day, like in a class, I couldn't take notes or anything. Uh -huh. I as soon as there's a pencil in my hand, I start drawing. <laughs> so so did, did you win any awards or recognition? Yeah, you, so, you know, in high school and stuff. Yeah, and, well, let's, yeah. I want to find out a little more about that. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. So when was the first time somebody recognized you for your art? Were you in grade school? Do you remember? I think it was mostly in high school. Mm -hmm. yeah, I had a really one wonderful art teacher mm -hmm. who was, you know, a great role model. Pretty good painter as I think back on it where he came. And he had a, he had a sense of humor, but he also had, had the ability to teach content. So that was a, that was a big thing. And did he shout out to you and said, hey, you, you, you have something here? Yeah, I think he did. I mean, I've, it's hard to know when you think those things, but uh, he was very supportive. And in fact, I think the first painting I ever sold was to him. Oh, wow. And that painting actually has shown up in California. Somebody uh, a year ago got in touch with me to say <laughs> this was the Glenn Rennell who <laughs> had this painting, which is a really kind of a nice landscape that I did when I was 16, that uh, I look at it and go, well, you know, I haven't changed that much. <laughs> so, <laughs> And so do you remember what you, did you, how much you got for it when you sold it to? It was either 35 or $50. Oh, that was a lot. That was a lot of money oh, yeah. in 1965, 64. Oh, yeah. So yeah. this guy really appreciated what you could do then for him I to think do so, that. yeah. What was his name? Uh, Walter Webb. Walter and, Webb. Uh, he gave me, when I graduated from high school, he gave me a, a book of uh, of La Mink, uh paintings and uh -huh. stuff. It was the first art book I ever really had. Uh -huh. and so that was, that was, I still have it. Yeah, you know? oh, that's very nice. Yeah. And do you know um, he's he's I assume not around anymore, Walter? No, actually, yeah, I, th I think he committed suicide, which oh. was devastating to me. But oh, that's horrible. Yeah, when was that? I didn't find out about it until the nineties, but you know, I think it would have been before then. So. Huh. So you have no idea about people, but yeah. I wonder was, what that was all about. Any idea? Not a, yeah. not a clue. Yeah. yeah, a painter who didn't make it, but yeah. and he yeah. was 
I don't think so. Yeah. I think I don't know what it was, but yeah. But the amazing thing is, when you think about somebody like this, Walter w Webb, Webb yeah. is he probably changed the way you looked at art and maybe your whole life in some extent. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that's so important. I think art teachers yeah. are so undervalued in our yeah. society. I think that you know, for me as a role model, he was somebody when I taught. I did the same thing. I tried to be supportive and come to it with, you know, be very serious, but not solemn. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is important stuff we're doing, but it's, you know, we can look at, you know, kind of lightly too and get through it. So. And so what, what did your folks do? What were their uh, let me see. My dad was um, mostly say when I was, he managed Woolworth five and tens. Uh-huh. And then he sold Buzzacadoza greeting cards in New York and New Jersey and stuff, and went you know from store to store with uh, suitcases of of uh, Buzzacadoza Buzzacadoza cards. I don't even know if they're still in business. <laughs> I doubt it very much. I doubt it. it. And even that job doesn't exist anymore. When you think about it, that you would take out samples of greeting cards, like Christmas cards, you take in May, right? To you know, get their orders and stuff, and he'd go from store to store to yeah. store. Did you go with him ever and do that? I've done, yeah, a couple times, and then yeah. It, what it was, was that like? It was, I don't know. It was bizarre. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a whole. He had the personality for it, and Sales. he made a very good living. You know, we, you know, we lived. You know, it was a good solid middle class and in kind of a really nice town on out on Long Island. So, and when you when you would be showing those cards, did you ever go, oh? You can make a living drawing or painting and making illustrations. I don't think so. No? No. I never... The commercial side of me just doesn't exist that way. <laughs> Still? Still. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Yeah. So. so you grow up in kind of the mid-60s. So when you graduate high school, is it like 67? 65. Oh, you're earlier. Yeah. Okay. So they weren't doing the Vietnam lottery at this point. No, that was before. Yeah. I went to... Out of high school, I went to Rhode Island School of Design for a year. Yes. And then didn't do very well. I was still, you know, I was 17 and not real mature mm -hmm. and, and stuff. So I uh, quit school, got drafted right away, was getting drafted rather. This and, is 66? And yeah, 66. Mm -hmm. And then so I joined the Navy mm -hmm. rather than go to Vietnam as a as in the Army. Right. So it was four years instead of two years, but, you know, I'm here today. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so that's that was a big deal. So sixty six to seventy, you were in Navy. Yeah, yeah. And what was your job in the Navy? I was a uh, aircraft mechanic on reciprocating engines, uh -huh. and actually started out with the jets and stuff. But uh, I went to Vietnam for one cruise. And what was that like? It was pretty awful. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And what was your job on the ship? I mean, in other words, I worked on the flight deck as a plane captain. Uh -huh. I, you know, I had was assigned one particular airplane that I had to make sure it was uh, maintained and all that sort was of. Was this stuff. like an aircraft carrier? Yeah. Oh, huge. Yeah. Huge thing. The Bonham Richard. Yeah. So, what was your job when you would do that? What's that like? I would uh, make sure all the maintenance had been done, and then when it was time for the pilot to get in, I would you know get him strapped in and uh, you know go through all the motions of, you know, making sure all the flaps and elevators and everything, you know, it all worked and mm -hmm. then uh, send them off. And then he would take off. And then yeah. it must have been very, um, I don't know, you, you have to wait for the plane to come back too, right? Yeah. And they don't always come back, right? Well, mostly they come back. Yeah. But yeah. Sometimes. My job when it came back, it would, you know, they would, the airplane would land, it would, you know, get caught right and then it would taxi up the deck and as it was taxiing i'd have to run out open a compartment on the back of the airplane take out a bag of chains and and uh not chains but pins put those in the, the as it was rolling up the deck i had to put the pins in the landing gear because they're held up by hydraulics yes and get that in while it's still going and then put on three three or four chains you know uh -huh. as they get there and it was that sounds quite dangerous, actually. It was dangerous. I got hurt really bad once. <laughs> yeah, what happened? Uh, we'd been uh, working around the clock because one of the air other aircraft carriers had uh, caught on fire. I think it was the America. I'm not sure on that. But uh, so we, uh, it was raining and I was tired. <clears throat> and 
as the plane's taxiing up the deck, I'm underneath there and I've got a uh, poncho on with a hood on it and it caught on the uh, gun chute. And uh, so that caught me. I fell down and the airplane r r rolled up over me. It sort Wait. of crushed my foot and stuff. Oh, my God. Yeah. And But did they keep you on the ship or did you? They... You know, the, oh, yeah. And 10 minutes before then, I, when the other airplanes were taking off before these other ones came back, uh, uh, a guy had been sucked down the intake of one of the airplanes, you know, which was completely, he was in the right place. He had done nothing wrong. But I guess the physics of it, the air gets sucked from different places, not like a, you know, a liquid that comes in. He just got picked up and sucked down. Toast. Uh, I don't know. I, I know that I was waiting to be looked at by the medics. Well, they're going, and both his arms and legs were broken. Oh, and, my. You know, he was flown off right away. Oh, So wow. I assume he didn't make it, but I, I he was, don't know. He was doing the same kind of job you are? He he was actually on the catapult crew. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. So, which is a little bit more dangerous. It's yeah. all dangerous. It's all dangerous. Yeah. When you're shooting off yeah. jets off yeah. of an aircraft. Yeah. And you did that. So you were there for four years doing that, pretty much? Uh, I did that for a couple of years, and then I worked on... Uh, became uh worked on uh, uh anti-submarine airplanes they had a big dome on top uh -huh. that would go out and so i was a mechanic for that so not when, a very good one but i was a mechanic <laughs> so when you're doing this is at any point in time do you go i kind of wish i had stayed at the rhode island school of design yeah well, there was quite a bit of that I but you know i don't i mean i wasn't a very good sailor and i didn't have a great time you know i had fun and everything yeah. but uh I think the time that it gave me to mature was a good thing. Mm -hmm. So when I did get out of the service, I went back to school and did very well, and you know, which probably wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. you know. Were you drawing and painting or doing anything while you were on the ship? A little bit, not much. Yeah, you were just surviving, doing yeah. your job. Yeah. Those are long, hard days on those, on those yeah, things, especially when you're at 16 war. 16 hour days and yeah. stuff, yeah. So you get out of the service yeah. and you're 20, 21? Let me see. Yeah. About that. 21. And, so. and so where do you go back to school? I went to, uh, first of my parents had moved by that time and moved to North Carolina in Charlotte. And so I went back there for about a year and I went to a community college and did nothing but I thought I was going to be an accountant. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I... I took, you know, huh. math classes and I took, you know, all the sort of academic things. And then I took one, one drawing class and I got, and I said, you know, this is crazy. I really love doing this. Right. And so that's where I decided after that. So I did a year of community college, uh, left there, came out to Arizona, worked at the uh, McNary Sawmill up in uh, the White Mountains. Mm -hmm. For almost a year. And working Got, the mill? Work, yeah, yeah, I worked um, as a fireman in there taking, you know, they uh, burn sawdust and stuff all night long to keep everything going and everything. Uh -huh. So I worked that, you know, it was great. I got to drive, you know, big machinery and stuff. So, uh -huh. I, but, you know, and then got married and moved to San Diego and then for about a year. And then went to uh, Fort Wright College of the Holy Names in Spokane, Washington, and got a BFA. In, in art. So you get married yeah. about 22? 23, I think yeah. it was. Yeah. And, and then you go up to, why Spokane? Uh, I wanted to find a college that wasn't very big, offered a BFA, and uh, was reasonable. And it had been an all-girls school mm -hmm. that had gone co-ed. It's since, since out of business. But... Uh, there were, I don't know, three or four other instructors and, you know, maybe a couple hundred students in the whole place. But uh, for me at that time, it was mm -hmm. a, it was pretty good. And did you think you would be a teacher or an artist, a painter, <sighs> or did you know? I didn't know at that point. I think I think I thought the teaching looked really easy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot easier than sawmills, that's yes, for sure. Yeah. So, but, you know, the, again, I, I, I'd liked physical jobs. I like, you know, I worked as a carpenter for a while and I did, you know, the, you know, the sawmill sort of thing. And mm -hmm. I, I like that sort of stuff. There's a real, I don't know, realness to it. But. Sure. And there's creativity. Yeah. And doing that. Yeah. So you found a college, you thought, okay, this is a place. Yeah. It's not too expensive. Right. I can get my degree. And I had the GI bill. 
and they will pay for it. Yeah, and the GI Bill at that time, when I got out of the service, I was making $300 a month. Mm -hmm. And when I got the GI Bill, that was like $370 a month or something. So I was making more money going yeah. to school than I ever made in the service. And you get to paint and draw and do all yeah. those things. And it turned out to be a pretty, there were a few really good instructors there. And uh, it's, it, for me, it worked out really well. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and so you do that and you get your BFA. BFA. And so you're, is that a two year program for you or a three? It, I did it. I did three years worth of work in two years. So I was taking twenty four credits a semester. Oh my! Yeah, you were motivated. What was so motivated? At that point, I think I just wanted to get through it. I felt like I was getting old, and I was, you know, yeah. for you know twenty three. Yeah, no, twenty five. <laughs> yeah. By the time I graduated, but you have a wife. Yeah, no kids. Or no anything. kids. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so it, it worked out well. You know, in that sense. And Spokane was a great little city back then. I'm sure it's nice now, too. Mm -hmm. But You didn't want to stay after you finished? There wasn't anything to do there. Yeah. yeah. So what did you do? You finished your, get your, get your BFA? We, what what um, did you decide to do? Decided to go to Maine. I asked my grandmother. She had an old house in the, out in the country she didn't live in. Mm -hmm. And I asked her if we could spend the winter there. <laughs> she said, sure, honey. Sure. If you want it. Yeah. Well, she had, she bought the place after World War II, mm -hmm. and uh, just used it like a summer camp. I don't know. If, I don't even, don't know that she ever spent a night there. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we went up and uh, spent the winter, and eventually she just gave the place to us. It was it, was, it should have been torn down. Uh -huh. And where in Maine was it? This is uh, twenty five miles west of Portland, southern okay. Maine. Okay, so not horrible weather wise, right? No. Yeah. Not compared to northern. Maine. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. And so you are 26-ish or so, yeah. and you're in this yeah. isolated cabin, well, more a, or less? Well, no, it was a really nice uh -huh. house visually. Yeah. It was built in 1813. Oh, wow. Uh, but at that point, the sills underneath were all rotted. The, the roof leaked. There were big holes in the side where, you know, <laughs> squirrels and wind came through <laughs> at will, you know. Uh -huh. So, but... Uh, and so you figured you could fix all those and probably did. We did eventually. But I, you know, this is how I, you know, sort of be, could learn how to be a carpenter. You mm -hmm. know, as we hired somebody at, for a little bit and then he, he had me start to work for him because I, you know, learned fairly quickly and was, you know, reliable, I guess. Yeah, that's so, my question. When you go to Maine, you've got your BFA, but what do you plan to do with it in, <laughs> in west of Portland, Maine? Or did you? You probably didn't have any plans. Didn't have any plans, really. Yeah. I thought by that time I thought I was going to go to graduate school. Uh huh. And that was a plan. So I had a year off between undergraduate and graduate. So, uh, so we went to Maine, and then I started applying to schools and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and your wife was enjoyed all this. She was cool. Yeah, with this? Gail's always been supportive. Yeah, that's you good. know, which is you know pretty nice. Yeah. So. And so you applied to graduate school. Yeah, and uh, so. Went to uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And back then, it was a two-year program. And it was sort of at the, the end of modernism. You know, so the, the, the instructors that I had, most of them, were, uh, you know, 50s and 60s painters who mm -hmm. came out of, some of them came out of World War II. And, you know, one of them studied with Hans Hoffman. Wow. And, you know, so it was, it was, they were some really good painters. Uh, they were pretty good teachers, most of them. And uh, so graduate school was, it was a good time to go. Mm -hmm. This is what? The 76, 78 is yeah. when I was there. So, And you're um, going to get your master's in fine arts? Is that what you're Yeah, doing? MFA in painting. Yeah. And what were you painting at this time? What kind of what imagery? A, well, in undergraduate, mm -hmm. you know, when I started painting, I was doing... They're really awful, but they were these <laughs> sort of autobiographical memory paintings of being in the service and all this sort of stuff. And they were just hideous. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody, when, when I was shown to an instructor, they wanted to talk politics about this and uh -huh. content and this stuff. So I said, well, screw this. I'm going to become an abstract expressionist. So all you can cut, talk about is the, the right. color and the design and stuff. Right. And that's what I did. So for most of undergraduate and all the way through graduate school, I'm an abstract painter. I'm, you know, 
throwing painting at a wall and thinking uh -huh. I'm a genius. <laughs> and so for those people who don't know your work, Glenn, is does these beautiful landscapes are quite realistic and they're, yeah. there's a tonalistic to them for sure. Right. But, you know, it's as pretty far away from abstract expression. Uh, yes and no. Okay, I want to hear that. Why? Well, I think there's a, I think I paint, even though they're representational and stuff, I'm painting with a sort of an, uh, an abstractionist mindset. Okay. You know, it's... To edit? To, a lot of it's the editing. You know, it's like the idea of the... Uh, how little can I do? I get Which that. Is, I the essentials that. and stuff. I'm looking for, you know, getting rid of anything that I think is extraneous. Yeah, and, I do see that in your yeah. your work. And color. I mean, I, I'm thinking color first before I'm thinking value or even drawing sometimes. So, <laughs> and composition. I'm, I'm, you know, how much is, you know, here, there, and, you know, I... So I'm not, I think my paintings, when they really work, work abstractly as well as they do representationally. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, when I look at them, I don't, I, I know you're, you paint in a more realistic form, but I don't think yeah. of you as like a tight painter or anything no. like that at all. No. There's a, that's the editing, there's a yeah. softness I almost to some, yeah. some way I see it. Um, yeah. but well, I think all painting is sort of selective recreation. Yes. So if I'm selecting a lot, you know, then it, it gets more realistic. If right. I'm, you know, selecting so less. Yeah. Yeah. Your barometer depends on how you're right. But you're very consistent in how you paint. I don't see a lot of, um, variation in the sense of, oh, he was very tight in this one or very loose in this. I no, there is some. And I think I see when you're in the inside doing it, you see it much more I'm than sure. you do on the outside. Sure. You know, so, yeah. To me, they look vastly different. To somebody from the outside, looks like, don't you get tired of doing the same thing? <laughs> well, that has to do, I would think, with, you know, the mechanics and what was involved to make that painting, too. Yes, yeah. And what the painting is and what I'm trying to do in it, yeah, too. Yeah, what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. So how long did you do Abstract Expressionist? You did it, your undergraduate, graduate. And, yeah. And then, and then afterwards, when you get yeah, out, you for do... about four years. There was, you know, I was showing some of it in Washington, D.C., in New York, and Boston. Uh -huh. And then uh, one winter. In galleries? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, not any great success, but, you know, galleries would look at it and they'd show it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So... But uh, it felt empty to me after a while. You know, and was the emptiness the, the emptiness as far as making the process wasn't fulfilling, or was it actually the the, the content? The Just, content. You know, okay. at some point, it's got to have it's got to be more than color and design and you know gesture and all this sort of thing. Just wasn't resonating to me. No, for what you were doing. Yeah, for me as a person, you know, and I think that. Uh, it was very, it was sort of a gradual transition. I uh, started doing watercolors uh, of uh, log, log cabin quilt designs. So these things that'd be, you know, like a 20 or 30 by 40, so a couple of them of these watercolors, little tiny marks going like this in a log cabin quilt print. Mm. And just using, and some would come out looking like a, sort of a Mandela, you know, this uh -huh. color just sort of, you know, coming out. But that was this idea. All of a sudden, I'm painting something, which was this pattern. It was a quilt pattern, but it was like this little step in the way of that. And I said, well, what the heck? <laughs> Why don't I just start doing landscapes? Right. And I did. Yeah, and what year was that? Uh, 82, 83, uh -huh. around in there. So you do abstract expressionist stuff for six, seven years, maybe? Yeah. yeah. And do you still like abstract expressionist yeah. paintings? I yeah. mean, others not besides yeah. your own. Sometimes I, surprisingly so, you know. I would think. Yeah. I, sometimes you just, you, you look and it just feels like, well, that's pretty. Yeah. Or that's, you know, isn't that nice? But but sometimes you see something and it just, it it, it moves you, you right. know, because it's, it, it, even though it's not obvious, there's reference outside it, it that talks to you as a human being. Yeah. You know, that some sort of soul level thing happens. And uh, that happens more often than I would have thought. 
It doesn't so, surprise me at all. Yeah. What What I'd like to know though is, have you ever gone back to paint abstract expressionists again since that time frame? No. Not once. No. I think there there are times when I'm composing a painting. You know, I'll take a if I'm starting a large painting, I'll start with. Uh, a uh, piece of pastel on the canvas and I'll be, I'll draw very gesturally, mm -hmm. you know, much the way I would have started a, uh, an abstract painting, you know, and then I'll s slow down and I'll start to really look at intervals and where things are intersecting and stuff. So, but, uh, so yeah. you, so you go from these log cabin design yeah. watercolors and then you go, okay, let me try landscapes. Yeah. And I think that it was the big, big step. There was the year that my mother died. She died at 59 of uh, colon cancer. Oh, so yeah. was relatively young. And um, sh they were living in Maine again by that point too. And so I was driving back and forth almost every week, which is about, I don't know, a hundred miles or so. From, from where? Where, where were you living? Uh, we were living outside of Portland and they were up in, in So uh, you were still in this house? Yes. I see. Yeah. Okay. The whole time you're standing. Yeah. So, uh, so I was driving back and forth and I started doing paintings of, of driving. So it would be like the road at sunset or dusk mm -hmm. or something, you know, with, with tail lights and headlights and stuff at the bottom. Yeah. That's what you're being exposed to. Yeah. So seeing. that's, yeah. And from there, and those are all in acrylic. Hmm. Yeah. Which was, I don't know why. Well, most of the abstract work was a, acrylic mm. and then switch to oils because it gave me more, more freedom in what respect well with the acrylics i was always waiting for things to dry mm -hmm. with the oils you just keep on going yeah. you don't even think about you know just 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 do it right so that was a and so you switch over so your galleries that you have go i just yeah that all they just, just went away yeah did they yeah. tell you i mean did you go hey i'm doing this new stuff or do you just no, realize? No, I just realized that, that was no a way. whole different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then so I was doing these. Then I started showing those in 86, 87 uh -huh. and stuff. And then so you do it for, you've been doing those for five to seven years kind of thing? Not, not quite. No, I don't think that. It was like four or five, three or four or five. Yeah. Or, you know, but. And these are still the tail light pieces and well, road pieces? Well, yeah, but things. they became, you know. I don't know, bridges. I yeah. love bridges. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Maine. I know. Sense. There's, you know, water and bridges and uh -huh. stuff. And uh, Yeah, you live in the desert. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, uh -huh. it's pretty pretty safe. <laughs> yeah, that's what you say. I've heard you yeah. say that before. Yeah. And, and so you start doing these other things and find an audience? Yes. Yeah. Surprisingly so. Mm -hmm. You know, I look back and they, some of them look really good. But others are really... I don't know, awful. I mean, they're embarrassing. <laughs> do they come on the market at all? Yeah. They do? Yeah. Under your name? Yeah. Like, you sign it the same way you do? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, I'll look for this. <laughs> yeah. It's an uh, odd enough name or unique enough name. That right. There aren't too many of us. Right. And you can read your signature. So right. Some so, artists you can't. Yeah. And but it's, that's okay. And so when did you metamorphose into more of a landscape painter? <sighs> I think we're sort of from the tail lights on you know from that uh -huh. stuff it was it was pretty quick was I that know. a hard thing to do to go from i mean you've gone from abstraction to you know no uh, bridges to i don't think so i think that all the way through school and everything i always took every drawing class i could every figure drawing class i could possibly good I, which is smart i think yeah i think you know and so th there was always that connection to work and representationally mm -hmm. and uh that was that was important it was it was a big part of me whether i wanted it to be or not mm. you know and uh so the skills and everything that that i had from doing that you know brought me into doing the paintings pretty quickly but the i was doing a lot of large charcoal drawings of landscapes too and they were always much more uh, advanced than the paintings, you know, it was just cause it's so much simpler to, to draw that color mm -hmm. is very complex. Mm -hmm. and, and you still do some of that. Yeah. Or we had something. Yeah. yeah. You've nice. got a, one of the big black yeah, and white. Those are acrylic black yeah. and white, but yeah. Yeah. So. And we sold. 
Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. How yeah. about some more of those? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm not sure. I think a lot of it, it, sort of, it wasn't a good thing at the time, I think, but when I was teaching, I, by, I started teaching at Maine College of Art in 1980 as, as sort of a fill-in for a, a, a person and then very quickly got put on. So I was teaching full-time. And what, were you, what courses were you teaching? It was mostly drawing. And then I uh, started teaching a lot of uh, two-dimensional design and I would teach painting courses, like a second-year painting course mostly. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, it was, uh, I think initially at one point I was trying to, I was teaching, but I wanted to, I wanted to make the, the drawing, the painting that I wanted my students to make, mm -hmm. which is a terrible thing to do as a painter. <laughs> but it sort of got me to go through sort of the fundamentals and basics on my own by, you know, that maybe I missed that I didn't get in school because I was working abstractly that I very uh, quickly, you know, sort of came up to speed with this stuff. And you learn from the students too, don't you? Yeah. You learn from the students, you learn from the faculty, the other faculty. I mean, that was, uh, I got, uh, education was much better teaching than it was actually going to school. And you're absorbing a different kind of right uh, muscle, art muscle. Yeah. Which is more. And you learn to, I think in school you learn to do things. You learn, you know, some things. But in teaching, you learn you have to find a way to use words to explain what you want somebody to do. So mm -hmm. you set up experience for somebody, and it, you can't do it by just pointing and go. Ugh. You yeah. know, you've got to have in that ability to turn it around and become articulate verbally mm -hmm. was something I was never good at. And that's, that's from teaching that came. You got better at that. Much better. Yeah. Yeah. So. And how long did you teach? Until 2001. So from 20 years, 21. But then I had also taught a few, you know, other courses for the university of Maine and stuff before I went to the art mm -hmm. school. But And so was this at this college that you were Maine teaching college the whole time, 20 years at the same yeah. place? Yeah. Wow. That's a long time. So you really, I mean, you had a whole career as a teacher. Right. But and you're painting still for painting. galleries and yeah. as well too, right? Yeah. During this period of time. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was always hard because you'd paint all summer and you would, you know, tell yourself, I'm going to paint all winter and yeah. get to be, you know, mid semester. And you'd uh, say, <laughs> I can't do this. You know, yeah. and you'd, you know, slack off, you'd work over Christmas break, mm -hmm. you know, really hard. And then, you know, the, so I think that there's a downside to, to teaching that for me there was. I mean, some people balance them both beautifully, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was very much a roller coaster sort of thing. Yeah. You were either teaching or you weren't. Right. And when you. Had, and it's exhausting. Yeah. You know, it I've sounds like an easy teachers. job. No, it doesn't at all well it, you know as a kid i looked at it i thought it would be an easy job but no it wasn't yeah not if you're going to give it your all and really no. try to help these students become yeah. better and and yeah. did you have some students that went on to succeed like, yeah yeah they're out there yeah any names that you can not really remember? but you know a lot of people who are teaching uh you know we're actually ending nearing the end of their careers at wow. this point the you ones know? that you've taught are, yeah are, wow yeah and uh yeah, nobody, you know, some really good solid painters, though. Mm -hmm. That yeah. made a living as a painter. Yeah. Yeah, that's hard to do, I think. Yeah, very few. And so why did you quit teaching if you did it for 20 years? Uh, well, two reasons. One is I really wanted to paint full time, mm. you know, which was something. If, if I'm going to be a decent painter, I can't do it the way I've been doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so... That was a big part of it. And then Gail, uh, she's a nurse and had been doing travel nurse assignments and wound up at doing one up at, at Chin Lee mm -hmm. at uh, Canyon de Chez. And what year was that? Uh, 99. Yeah. So uh, I had a, a sabbatical coming. So I took a year off with that and we came out. And so I painted up there and this is the first real taste of painting full-time i see 
you know, and I mean, really, really full time. You and know? you're living up in Chinle? Yeah, on the at the hospital. Yes. And the government housing there. Yes. And got one of the backcountry passes for the for the reservation. And so I was all over the place painting all the time. Could you and, go down in the canyon with that pass? No. Yeah, too bad. Not legally. Yeah, you yeah. did, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, possibly you did. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, a lot of, you know, I I really love the overlooks myself. It's like, oh, yeah, no, you know, I don't Because you can see the distance and the, yeah. you know, the sky and the edge and everything. So, yeah. yeah. And, and she, what's your, what's she doing at the time in, in the hospital? She's working in the operating room. She's working uh, in the circulator yeah. for, and, uh, and she loved it there. It's really a fun, I mean, fun's not the right word. It's really a um, unique place in the world, I think, yeah. generally. I mean, the people right. are, are wonderful, and but there's lots of problems and issues with, yeah. you know, alcoholism. One of the things. nice things is that it's not on the edge of the, the res. Right. So that you, you know, what gallops, I can't remember what, 120 miles oh, yeah, or something. It's a, long way so it's a long way to go shopping and stuff. Yes. And so uh, that's... I think culturally, there's there's still all the overlap of everything, but it's it's a little better there. The people were wonderful, mm -hmm. and we still have you know good friends who come down to visit, and we go up there every once in a while and go to uh, you know ceremonies occasionally, and certainly birthday parties, mm -hmm. which is a big thing. Yeah, but uh, so you know I love it, and I st and I I love a number of the people that uh, we, we're still in touch with from there. And you were never tempted to do some figurative drawings of the people while you were there? No. Always just the landscape, huh? Yeah. Have you ever put figure in, in what you're doing now, figurative things no. like horses or no. hogans or anything? No. no. <laughs> it just, it, and why I, is that? I mean, especially when you see a landscape and a hogan is almost... I mean, to me, it feels like... Well, I have like, done that. I've done a few. Actually, yeah. you sold a couple of yeah, years I mean, ago. Yeah, it feels like but, it's uh, a landscape. Anyway. I know. I have this... I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. It's like, I want the painting to be about the person viewing it more than the person in it. Yeah, I understand that. And so there's like this psychological thing for me in it. And so it becomes an ethics to you almost in a weird way. Yeah, very, I mean, that's, that's a strong word, but uh -huh. yeah. It, it's, yeah. Well, your ethics though. Yeah, mine. Yeah. yeah. That's what yeah. I mean, that, you know. Yeah. Thou shall not paint <laughs> figurative or land yeah. structures other than what the land is. Yeah. I've been doing, I, I, I have been putting buildings in, which is a big step for painting. Well, yeah, and I think that, you know, buildings to me are part of the landscape and yeah. uh, time, especially hogans and things like that. I mean, yeah. they go back to the land anyway, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. And um, well, I had a couple, I did a couple of paintings of, uh, like little White House ruins, nothing, yeah, and the White House ruins too. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. And did you spend? A, did you get to spend a lot of time in Canyon de Chelly when you were there? Not a lot, but some. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty remarkable place. Yeah, we'd do some hiking and had a good Navajo friend who wasn't allowed to go in there either yeah. because he was from Lukachukai. Yeah, no, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be, be of the families mm -hmm. and everything. But we would get away with it because he's Navajo and. Uh, Myself and Gail were were white, so he would pretend to be a guide. <laughs> <laughs> to get you down. <laughs> well, he was kind of sort of, way. yeah. But he would uh, scope out uh, places of, like old uh, trails and stuff that go up over the side of the canyon yes. and stuff. And uh, with his binoculars, and then he'd say, "Well, let's let's go this way. If we go down this way, we can go across and go up the other way." Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I'm not good at that. Yeah. Gail's really good, you know, but heights and stuff, you know, yeah. I just I, I yeah, can't and these are very high cliffs. Yeah, plus they're, you know, the Anasazi or whoever, you know, they were little tiny people. Yeah, and they didn't have size 15 shoes to <laughs> you know, sticking in these things to hold on. Yeah, so. the, the little chip yeah. out holes and things. Yeah. And so you're there for just a year? At Chile? No, two and a half years. Oh, yeah, that's a long yeah, time. So I had a year sabbatical. And uh, then I had uh, two years where I taught the fall semester and then would take the rest of the year off. Mm. And I thought it was a good deal. But it, it was like looking back, it was just a way to step out of teaching yeah. and stuff. So I would come out uh, in December after uh 
teaching and then spend the rest of the year. And then uh, on the third winter, it was a cold winter and uh, it was too cold to paint outdoors. And that time I was doing, you know, 95% of what I did was on site painting. Mm -hmm. So uh, that third winter I came down to Bowie with uh, the RV and spent six weeks painting in that area, which is pretty much sort of where we live at this point, you know, in that part of the state. Mm -hmm. and, was Gail still working in Chinle at the hospital? Yeah. Then? Yeah. Yeah. So did you come down to Bowie by yourself? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. paint it. And she'd come down on a, you know, a weekend or something. Yeah. I'm sure to get out of the freezing. It can be very yeah. cold up there. Yeah. So the first two winters up there were relatively mild. It was, it would be in the thirties, maybe 30 to 45, sort right. of in the afternoons when I go out painting. But uh, the third winter, it never, you know, the snow stayed up on the, the mesa up there and uh -huh. just didn't go away. Yeah. Yeah. It was a so, hard one. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I've seen those up there. And yeah. so you came down to Bowie and you, yeah. and you liked it. I liked the, the landscape of the area. Yeah. It's kind of, it's a, for Arizona, it's kind of a modest landscape. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Yeah. And so that for me, it's sort of ideal. I don't like... This is another one of those things. I, I don't want the, the landscape to be so dramatic that it dominates the, the, the painting, that yeah. it becomes, that becomes a subject so much, mm -hmm. which I always found when I painted the Grand Canyon, that was difficult. Yeah. You know, because it is so spectacular. Right. But you could do Canyon Shea by just being up top and just yes. ignoring the hole. And just, well, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. Yeah. It is pretty amazing to see Canyon de Shea from that. Right. I mean, it just, you don't see anything and then all of a sudden it's all there. Yeah. It's like one of the, the, the kids I knew up there, he was, they, they took a class trip over to see the Grand Canyon and he said, oh, I, ours is much better. You can, you can get down to the bottom. You can, you don't have to. It is much better. It is much better. Way better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but I painted a lot on the areas, like up behind the hospital up there in the Mesa, it just opens yeah, I know, you know what that is. And see all the way what Black Mountain or whatever yeah. behind there and stuff. And and uh, one of the the stories I like telling is that I was uh, about I don't know seven or eight miles behind the hospital up there, and it's just jeep track sort of mm -hmm. thing out there, north of the hospital, or or it's sort of going uh, west okay. of the hospital. Yeah. You know, in this, you know, it's it's all Navajo out there. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so I'm out there painting. I'm in the. It's, it's windy and I'm in the lee of this big rock and uh, I'm painting away and all of a sudden this van comes sort of screaming up and these two uh, Navajo guys get out and they're, you know, don't have shirts on and uh, they you know, look like, you know, what the hell are you doing out here kind right. of guys and they come over there and then I see what I'm doing and they get all excited, you know, because yeah. this guy's actually painting this thing. So all, out there, there's no electricity or anything, but they all have cell phones. And so they, they call up and all of a sudden there's like 12 people out there watching me paint. <laughs> In the, the, in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere, right. literally. And this little tiny old Shema there comes over and she's looking at my painting. And, and it's the painting is of mostly sky, but there's sort of this monolith rock that comes up out of the, the, the desert out there. Uh -huh. And that's really sort of, the, but it's this little tiny thing in this little, you know, little painting. And she, she, she can't understand. Why is it so small? Why is it so small? And stuff. <laughs> But it turned out they became very friendly and invited me back to paint any time and everything. So it was, it was nice. Yeah. No, that's, I mean. And that's, that was the typical thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If you're not doing any harm or you're, right. you know, if you seem like you should be there, yeah. uh, then that's not an issue. It's the people that are not, shouldn't be yeah. there doing things that and they shouldn't be By there. doing that, actually, the, uh, there's a canyon to the north of Canyon de Chez. Mm-hmm that runs parallel to it. You know, like if you're going up to Luca Chukai, on the other side of the highway, there's another canyon. But it's really not open to the public at all. Mm -hmm. And the guy who ranched there or farmed there, whatever, I got to know him because he would go down to get water at a, a place where I was painting. And he invited us to go in there and, and to hike around. And in there, the ruins aren't reconstructed. And the, the you're right up. It's very personal. Oh, and wow. just, you know wonderful wonderful place and so we went in there a number of times yeah i bet yeah yeah you're gonna have to take me yeah, well, <laughs> he's still around i don't think he's around anymore oh, too bad yeah <laughs> but yeah it's it pretty pretty impressive oh yeah, yeah.
seeing nature untouched and ancient ruins untouched is a it's pretty compelling yeah it's really compelling yeah put yeah. your little little lifespan in context to something that's very yeah it yeah. does and and it's nice too that it is untouched yeah. Yeah, no one's messed with it and won't mess yeah. with it. Yeah, I think that in getting up close with the rock art and stuff, and yeah. the, and the pot shards and this sort everything, of thing, it just you know, and you and you get that sense of that connection that these were your people in a way, not that they, it, as artists, that the hand that made the the stripe on the pot mm -hmm. is the same hand I draw with. It's you know, true. The same sort of touch, you know. And yeah, uh, they were the, the same people that didn't do well in hunting, yes. but they said, "I'm very good at drawing, but <laughs> yes. I'm not a very good hunter." I'm sorry. Yeah. And the, and the, I gave a talk on design once years ago, but it was it was, and I was using some of those images of photographs I've take, taken of them, and trying to explain this is the same phenomenon that that we look at, and we get excited about is this uh, figure ground and figure ground reversal, where the 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 black is the positive, and then it becomes the white becomes the positive as you look at it, mm -hmm. and uh, it's like magic to the eye, and that's a big part of painting. It's mm -hmm. a big part of you know art, and you know that delight that we take in the visual is is crosses all culture. Yeah, it's you know? human. And it's it's human. It's, it's Homo sapien, I think. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. why we are Homo sapiens. Yeah, because we. Can and I think it's why we're that. still making paintings today. When you really think about it, it's really, yeah, do we need any more paintings? <laughs> My answer is yes. Yes, I know. And yours too. I, it is. And it's, you know, I sometimes ask myself, is, does the world need another one of these? Yeah. But, you know, the, <laughs> that idea that we communicate uh, through visual arts is just, it's almost like magic, mm. you know? And it's, and I think that one of the reasons I, I, I sort of do paintings that I think of is, sort of simple in a way is that I want that, you know, sort of poetic quality to it, but you're drawn into it. What's in what seems like a, just a perceptual way, but it's more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and if it can sustain it, it's like that, you know, one, two, three, four day time, you know, can you sustain somebody looking at a painting or do they just glance and see, feel like they see the whole thing? Mm hmm. You know, it's like, you know, can I sustain that? Do, we, you know, and, and do you think what's required, you know, looking at your painting to really get what you need to get out of it? Do you have to spend some time looking at it? A viewer, not you, but me. I hope so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I think if you're going to live with a painting, you know, it should be something that you don't see the same thing every time. Right. I love that when I have a painting yeah. like that. Yeah. It's just, there's magic in it that way. Yeah. So. And is that your goal as an artist to, when you, you know, finish a painting to have some kind of essence of emotion that you can go, I got it? I think that's a, that's an ambition. Yeah. Okay. I don't think that I, and some, and, and, and the maker doesn't always know. No, they don't. It's the viewer oftentimes that sees it with clear and fresh eyes. Yeah. You know, it's like seeing a, when I see a painting that I've done like 20 years ago, I'm often surprised about. Just, how good it was? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it, but but mostly it's how good it was. Yes. And uh, and sometimes it'll be like I'll be really excited in the studio about something I'm working with in color that I think is is so fresh and brand new and God I've, I've really got something great. And then I, then I've, I've seen a painting from years ago and I was doing the same, <laughs> same thing. thing. <laughs> but you know it's a little different. A little something was different, yeah. or you forgot, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I see that when I write sometimes. If I read old writing, I'm like, oh, yeah. God, how did I put that together like that? Yeah. That's actually quite good. Yeah. Um, usually, yeah. <laughs> not always. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it was T.S. Eliot that was talking about po poetry, mm -hmm. but he said uh, poetry uh, communicates before it's understood. And I think that paint, the visual arts do that. Mm -hmm. I think I'll, certainly music does it too, but... You know, that idea that uh, we we think it's just perceptual, but when we're looking at a painting, it, it's it's more than that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's speaking to you at a sort of a sense of life sort of basic thing. Do you think knowing the person can help understand the painting? I have mixed feelings on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I think because I've known some painters, I think are just nasty human beings <laughs> who have made some pretty compelling work, you know. So, maybe it comes out in their painting in some maybe, way. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's their way yeah. of being good. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think for me, I can understand paintings better when I have a sense of the artist yeah. as a person. Yeah. I think in these podcasts, I always get right. something that I hadn't expected yeah. that lets me look at them with a new light, the, right. the, the paintings. I'll look at yours with a different yeah. set of parameters. I think, I think there's that. But, it, but as I can remember reading, and reading artists' writings and stuff and being so disappointed in their writing and their stuff. And then... And in the art world, I think there's been a whole shift, you know, sort of postmodernist that's away from sort of the visual and the perceptual and the idea of beauty and going into, you know, very political things and everything where you need a wall tag to really understand what yeah. you're looking at. And uh, turns out that everything, you know, it comes down to this all this rigmarole is some, something like, well, racism is bad. You yeah. know, I had to work for this. Everybody right. knows that. You don't have to, right. you know, painting should be more than that. Yeah, more literal for you in some ways, you think? I don't, not literal. Emotional? Well, I'm not sure. It, less. You know it when, you hit, when it hits yeah, you? Yeah, I, I think there's, I think ideas are easy. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, and I think that, this is, you know, my personal opinion here, but I think every artist has one idea and that's who they are. Mm -hmm. And you spend a lifetime sort of looking and searching for that. And ideally you really don't find it. You sort of just keep on going and going and going until you don't, you know. Because that fuels the creativity by not exactly finding yeah, it. I, you know, I don't know what I'm doing when I'm doing a painting. <laughs> That's each the painting? feeling. Each painting, uh -huh. there's, there's a feeling that I don't know what I'm doing, that compels me to make the painting. Uh huh. You know, and I don't think that goes away. I, maybe it does, but I don't know. And you know, artists seem to be driven in a way that yeah. other people aren't. Yeah. Um, and if it were easy, you wouldn't do it. Yeah, that's true. Same with golf. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. if you... well, mo most things that are you know hard to do become more engaging. And uh, so I think that, you know, when somebody comes up in your painting and they go, I wish I could do that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it looks like so much fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you know, they, they're a little moments of, of, of enjoyment. Of, yes. <laughs> but, you know, but they're most of it's work, you know, but in a very engaging way. Yes. Yeah. You know? And so. You know, well, it's compelling. There's something about what, that you're forced to do it. I think artists are. There's something that makes them do it. Right. You know, they can't stop doing it. And and I've never heard, at least I, that I can think of an artist going, oh, yeah, it's really, I, it's fun to go out and paint. There are times that it's enjoyable when they go out into the field and get to see yeah. a beautiful landscape. And yeah. that part, I guess, is fun. But it when you're getting down to the making and the producing uh, of something that you can also sell and represents what your right. ideas are, I, I don't. I don't see the fun part. No, it's not awful. It's not no. like you know, slavery or anything. And you do it every day. Yes. Yeah. You know, you'll get up yeah. and do it eight hours or whatever you do. How often do you paint? Uh, I can't sustain it as long as I used to. Right. But uh, usually from like ten in the morning, then a lunchtime, and then until about five in the afternoon. Yeah, so that's still really yeah. a lot. Of, I mean, you're standing yeah, and you're I take focusing. Yeah, every once in a while. Yeah, too. you're focusing. Yeah. yeah. And you've been doing this now for yeah. 50 years yeah. almost. Yeah. yeah. So You think you're getting better? Yeah. That's good. That's, yeah. that's, I see that sometimes in artists as they age. Yeah, I think I'm, you know, I think the last few years actually there's something, some nice little, you know, incremental steps in the painting i would agree with that actually yeah so, I, I i think your paintings continually yeah. get better I, this yeah. last little group that you know the two of them yeah. hanging on the wall just found fantastic paintings. yeah so and that's you know that's a, certainly a re reward just getting you know having things develop and stuff so you know who knows what happens it's it's not a straight line either uh -huh. you know i'm i've been i've 
can see my, I go off on these tangents and stuff that are a dead end. And he realized, I've just spent nine months here doing <laughs> this and, and there's nothing at the end of it, you know. And so how long have you been in Arizona? So when you come down to Bowie, how long? Well, that was when? We, uh, so that year we decided, okay, we're going to, this is the third year up there, mm -hmm. third winter for me. So we decided that we would, uh, moved to Arizona and we uh, went back and in May or June of 2001, mm -hmm. spent all summer, you know, sort of getting the, the house ready to put on the, the market. And then, uh, so we put it on the market and sort of a day or two later was 9-11. Yeah. And uh, so that we were really fortunate to be able to sell the house at the, that point. And uh, one of the nice things was that uh, this house that, that should have been torn down, we had, you know, over the years spent a lot of time and money and could have built a really nice house when right. we put into it. But uh, they did a, uh, on the back then, the uh, Sunday paper had a whole real estate section. And on the front of, front of that, they did a, uh, a full page color photograph thing of, of the, the the house every week that was the best thing out right. there and that they did that for us and usually they were you know multi-million dollar homes on the on the water and right. this was this old uh farmhouse and you know artist studio and stuff and uh and it was from the 1820s 1813 1813 wow yeah, yeah that's really early in yeah. america yeah so it was yeah and so you sold your house Sold the house, came out here, and uh, then bought down in Pierce, and, and stayed ever since. But you, you make you for a long we time. We go back you make, every year. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say you go back up year. to Maine, and, yeah. and in the past two summers, I have, I've had shows back there in the summer. Right, so, I knew you did. Yeah, so and the that, subject matter you choose to do in Maine is it's trees and fields and uh -huh. you know, no boats. No, it's it's like <laughs> I know <laughs> <laughs> the whole idea of what's a cliche and what isn't. Yeah. You know, and to me, it's very personal. You know, I just, Clearly. you know, I just can't do it. And you know. <laughs> I won't ask you well, after, after Hopper, you know, who's going to do a lighthouse, right? And yeah, that no, makes it harder. Yeah. yeah no. And, it does. Uh, so. Yeah. And so what would you, what advice would you give to artists? You've done this for 50 years. You taught for 20. You've made a living, you know, as an artist. Yeah. What would your recommendation for people who might want to go into this as an artist? From the very beginning, or from yeah, I mean, uh, what, I mean what are the? I'm obstacles? not sure. I'm not sure what I would do today. I don't think that I would thrive in in art school today. I think it's you know, they're just sort of intellectual cesspools at this point. Mm. I shouldn't say that, but, yeah, you say but I do you think. think that you know, and just there's a lot of group think, and and I think that the fundamentals uh, really aren't being taught. Mm. You know, drawing color you know these things that they they sort of pay lip service to but they don't take to any depth so i don't know and plus i think that you know the idea is that you want to be able to do what you want to do and not be told i want to learn how to do what it takes to be me as a painter or mm -hmm. somebody as a painter but i don't think you can do that as easily in art school as you could back, you know, any, people have been complaining forever. It's so like right. in the seventies and everything. Well, they won't teach me drawing and they won't, you know, cause they were, it was all abstraction, right. but there was still a lot to learn there, you know, and you were, you know, I, I don't know today. I think that I would probably get a degree in something else and then become a painter. Mm. I mean, take courses in drawing, color ther yeah, theory. Yeah, if you and could find kind of somebody who taught it a really fundamental, basic way. And, uh, you know, I have misgivings about, you know, doing workshops and stuff too, because I think they, people <sighs> take a workshop from somebody because they like their painting and they want to paint that way. Yeah. And, you know, that's the last thing you should want to do is paint like somebody else. No, it's so true. You've yeah. got to find your voice. So I don't, I don't know what the good answer is. Although I think that we're, we may be in a golden age of painting and just don't know it. In what respect? I think there are so many more people working out there today as painters. Mm -hmm. 
and working uh, in ways that take into consideration everything. Uh, that they're not sort of dismissing modernism. They're not dismissing anything and mm -hmm. just really becoming painters. So I don't know. Jill Carver is an example. Mm -hmm. There's somebody who I think is a really terrific painter. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. And so, but she's like a full thing. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but, but I wouldn't take a workshop from her. Sorry, Jill. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and why not? Because I, no, I would, I actually, I think she's very interesting. I would probably learn something. Yeah. But I, 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 there are things she does in paint I would love to be able to do. But I don't want to go and copy Jill Carver. Yeah. You know? Not, though, of course, I don't think anybody who would even take her workshop, even if they were very good, could copy Jill Carver. No, I don't. I, well, I think that's the fallacy of taking workshops yeah. from people thinking you're going to learn how they paint. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I think that's right. Yeah. That's a, it's an innate gift. I mean, you have to find that gift and then focus right. on that which is yours. Right. Not which is someone else. But, yeah. I, you know, I haven't taken workshops, though I've watched them and gone to them. Yeah. And I think there's things that artists can learn from those skill sets of how to look at things, color and how to right. set up just basic yeah, things. Sure. And, and to watch somebody paint, clearly you get some... Uh, you learn something, something from that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. as a dealer, I do too, by the way. Yeah. Watching people paint, artists paint, I learn a greater deal of how things are done technically. Oh, sure. Which is, I think, yeah. important. I think all art dealers should have to watch people paint. Yeah, I, they would we, understand it differently. Yeah, they don't understand, yeah. I think, to a lot of extent. Yeah. They just look at it well, as. See, my students, like in a drawing and design class, they would, they, I'd never show them my work. They had no idea, and then there would be like a faculty show or something, right. and they'd see this serene, quiet landscape, and here's this big, loud mouth guy who's been yelling at him for a year, <laughs> and they, you know, making that connection was oftentimes very surprising to them. Yeah, they were expecting some modernist or something. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. And you said, so, "No, nah, I was that guy like back in the seventies." Yeah. <laughs> We're definitely not that guy now. Yeah. Any parting words you want to tell us? Ask a question. One more yeah, question. Yeah, one, one more question. <laughs> What's next? <clears throat> I think it's always more of the same, but I don't know. You know, I I think that I'm, you know, I've got some really good paintings going in the studio. Mm -hmm. They I feel ex I'm excited about them and uh you know, I'm just trying to sort of stay healthy and keep on right. going and uh, keep painting. I yeah. do have a question for you though. You yeah. sit, you 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 paint. When you paint large, I love it. They're big yeah. and they're wonderful, and I'd like to see more of that personally. But you seem to like to do smaller works. Am I right there, or is it just what you give me? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's both. I think I do like to work small, just because I'm a slow painter. Mm -hmm. So I can, you know, just, I can get through paintings and, and in a funny way, I think I, I learn things by paintings, you know, one painting to the next. I always, I'm still working on the series that I started in 1960 something. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> you know, I, I do think that and it's like this sort of widening gyre that I keep going around and around and around and I'm picking up these little things. So sometimes I think I, I learn more by doing uh, smaller paintings. But larger paintings are much more difficult and they ask for a different way. It's like you can take a, a broad you know, swipe of color in a small painting mm -hmm. relative, and you think, well, I can just expand that to a large painting. It doesn't work mm. because it's just, then it just sort of dies. So it becomes a different, different animal. A I, different beast. Yeah. I think they're very, um... Uh, effective your the large paintings yeah i really would like to see more of them quite frankly i, yeah. I think they're your, not that i don't like your small ones they're wonderful right. but there's a different yeah. sense to your big ones uh yeah. the you feel the expansiveness the loneliness yeah. whatever it is yeah i think it shows more of what you're really trying to perceive yeah. well the the little that painting over there yes that one's there's a uh, a larger painting of that on the studio wall right now. Bring it in when you finish. Would you? All right, yeah. good. See, I was I knew I should have you on this podcast. I know. I'm yeah. going to get a nice big painting. Yeah, I got a couple actually. <laughs> good. 
And uh, you should look at my Instagram account. There. Okay, what is your Instagram account? Let's give it up. Uh, I don't know. Rennell Denton painter or something glenn rennell just brings it up okay but, so put in glenn rennell and you can go to his instagram yeah and uh, so i've been posting a lot of the main work that i've done from okay. back in maine and then on uh, the western stuff and trying to keep it all a, a sort of recent work good are you doing that yourself or is your wife helping you with that or i'm doing that pretty much myself good. Yeah. a Thank friend you. has been nagging me to do they're this. right it's important social media is important yeah. and i'll be putting up a, a new website this coming month okay and will that been, be your web your name or what yeah yeah very good yeah it's just that's the side of the thing that i don't really enjoy yeah but but it's important it is important just like doing podcasts i guess Do you have so. fun doing this yeah you had to think about it yeah. <laughs> I don't know. he did it's like fun like painting you yeah know? okay all some, right some parts of... <laughs> it was enjoyable yeah. but yeah. maybe not so much fun yeah. all right glenn so, I'll let you go. I'll let you get back to painting. It was really nice having you. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Art Dealer Diaries. Glenn Rennell. Go to his Instagram. All right. Bye. That was fun. That was fun for me. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.